A man kidnaps his own child. He says that he did it to save her from sexual abuse. Her mother says that he's brainwashing their daughter and using her to make money off of a sympathetic public. Sophie Long was last seen on July 12, 2021 in Seguin, Texas. Her father has been on the run with her ever since. Is he a hero who is doing whatever he can to protect his daughter from a predator in a broken legal system? Or is he a mentally unstable man who may himself pose a threat to his daughter? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Sophie Long. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you for joining us once again. This is part two of the Sophie Long case. So if you haven't listened to part one, you'll definitely want to not listen to this and go back and listen to that one first. We typically don't cover parental abduction stories on this show. Usually we cover cases where there's a mystery surrounding the person going missing. In Sophie's case, we know what happened. Her dad took her. He even showed up with her a few weeks later to give an interview to the Daily Mail. To me, there is still a mystery. It's not what happened to Sophie. It's the idea of who is the villain and who's the hero. Or if we can even give those titles to anyone. Again, I do want to let you know up front that this case does deal with allegations of child sexual abuse. We do not go into extreme detail, but it is talked about. So please keep that in mind. So before I get into the second half of the story, I do want to kind of recap where we left off, which is that there was a disagreement about whether or not doctors found evidence of sexual abuse. Michael claims that Sophie had been diagnosed with vaginosis and yeast infections due to this abuse, but Kelly's lawyer claims that Michael doctor shopped and that medical examinations have found no evidence of sexual abuse. So before we get into this, I just want to talk for a minute or two about your impressions so far in this case, because, you know, you and I talked off mic after we stopped recording the first episode because you watched the video, the video that went viral last year of Sophie saying she was being abused. You watched parts of it, and it was really tough. Yeah, it's um, it's incredibly difficult to watch as a parent. But for me, it's 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 more difficult because I don't want to say I was in a similar situation. To, well, I, I guess I was in a similar situation to that where I was telling as a child, I was probably, I was a little younger than her, but I was telling my mother that I wasn't comfortable with us moving in with her boyfriend at that time. And uh, she basically said, I don't care. And it's difficult as a child, you're, you're brought up trusting your parents. And, you know, they say things like, you know, if, if, if ever anything's wrong or whatever, just tell me, I'll listen. And then they don't. It really kind of fractures you as a person. Because, you know, this is your most trusted person in your life at that point. So to watch that and to, to kind of personally know what she's going through, that she's being betrayed 
by her parents, it's it's indescribable to me. I mean, it just it's it hurts. It hurts to watch. It hurts to put myself in her situation. And she has no she has nowhere to go. She has no nobody yeah. to turn to. So it's just it's it's just really tough. And it I don't know who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, if there's any good guy in this situation. But it doesn't seem like there's anybody that she can reach out to. And that's really difficult. I think it's one thing looking at this from the perspective of a parent. But it must be quite another thing to look at it from both that perspective and then also being able to put yourself in the shoes of the child in this situation. That level of betrayal. Yeah. And what it can do psychologically to a person is just, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, when I say it fractures a person, it, it really does. It, it makes you question everything that you trust. It, it really makes you, uh, it makes you cynical towards, towards anything, towards any authority figure. You know, it, it, there's, it just, it completely alters who you are. And it's not something that's easy to get over. In this week's episode, we're going to get into both sides, meaning Kelly's side and Michael's side. But regardless of everything that they have to say and what their lawyers have to say, that little girl in that video was terrified. She was hurting. Something was going on. And the people who she was closest to didn't believe her. It's it's a betrayal. Yeah. Like you said, these are the people closest to her. This is your family members, the people that are supposed to love you, that, that are supposed to take care of you, the people that have been telling you your entire life how special you are to them. Yeah. And here you are in a moment of complete terror and no one's listening to you and no one is protecting you. It's awful. You don't even have to listen to the words she says necessarily or the accusations that she makes, but you can feel viscerally the emotion, right? Like when you watch that, you don't even have to know what she's saying to be able to feel what she is going through in that moment. Right. And that's, that's true, pure emotion. Yeah. So. And that's not coached. No, that's exactly And I'm and that's saying exactly that because that's going. exactly what we're going to talk about. Yeah. And that's where I was going. This is this is not something you know that one parent coached her to say. It's it's not a matter of her saying it. She was feeling it. And right. you you can tell that from the video. It's 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 pure emotion. And that's not something that can be coached. No. The words can be coached. But not, <laughs> not the way she was saying it. No. And not the feeling that came with it. Yeah. So after this video came out and the GoFundMe started and this whole thing started to go viral and it became a huge thing, Kelly's attorneys put out a press release saying, quote, Multiple medical providers, including a pediatrician, hospitals, and the Department of Child Protective Services, have all ruled numerous times after multiple medical examinations that there is no evidence of any sexual abuse or neglect, nor evidence to support other outrageous claims made by Michael. End quote. So, 
we're seeing a different side to the story because when I was going through this, if you look at a lot of the coverage from August of last year, after this video comes out, it's like, oh my God, we need to save St Sophie. The hashtag was stand with Sophie. It was Michael needs to get custody of these children. They're in a dangerous place. Why is the system broken? Then Michael was granted custody of the three children, which I mentioned briefly in the last episode. And there are stories and, you know, social media posts going like, oh my God, everything worked. Everything's great. He got custody like we won, right? But Kelly's lawyer started putting the idea out there very early on that none of this was real, that it was all a hoax, that this is something that Michael has perpetrated. And to me, I think that's, it's important in a situation like this to kind of look at both sides because like social media posts, you love having a villain, you love having a hero, you know? And when this video came out, just looking at the video independent of any other context, like Michael's the hero, Kelly's the villain, like it is extremely cut and dry. There's no nuance there's no gray area and you know kelly's lawyers are like oh this is video self-produced and heavily edited like okay i don't care that's not why it's kind of dry like this shit makes kelly look extremely bad however there is context like there's a larger situation that has been going on for years and it is important to recognize that yeah i mean i agree i i mean i i think that there's there's two sides to every story and right. more often than not in social media, we only see one side. Right, exactly. And, and it's usually the, the people that are putting that out, put it out to a specific crowd. Yeah, and you know, I think that social media loves to be binary. It's, you know, this is bad, this is good, right. whatever. And listen, like, I love that. I mean, I love a good mob, but <laughs> like, at the... <laughs> You know, at the same time, N nothing is. It's not, and ev everything, everything in this world exists in in grays. Right, and you know, the first stories were Michael is the savior, Kelly's the villain, and then there was the backlash saying Michael's crazy. Right. You know, Kelly's actually the good one, right? But I don't think either of those are true. I don't think any of it's true. Probably not, because even when we're hearing the other side of the story, quote unquote, there are things that to me don't really serve their case. So what I mean by that, and this happens a couple of times, but for this instance, like this press release, right? Where, you know, the lawyer comes out and says like, listen, Sophie's been examined multiple times. Like there's no evidence. This is all made up, right? They go on to say, quote, Sophie and her brothers have all undergone extensive interviews with forensic psychologists under the direction of CPS. During all interviews with these professionals, Sophie has never expressed an outcry. She has apparently only done so when coached by her father, Michael Long, and stepmother, Courtney Chalmers, during self-produced videos, end quote. So they are putting forth as evidence of this being fake, the sexual abuse being made up, the fact that she didn't tell a stranger that it was happening. What they're saying is that because she talked to psychologists, and never said she was being sexually abused means that it didn't happen. She told her grandmother in the car, and she didn't even do that at first. It took a while. She wouldn't say it. She just spent a lot of time saying, no, 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 I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And then finally came out with Mr. Jake touched me. But they even point to that as a reason why it's not real. They say, well, she didn't say it at first. She just said it toward the end. 
And now they're saying, well, she didn't tell the psychologist, so it can't be real. Yeah, and, and so I, I, I've 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 been in one of those interviews. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's incredibly uncomfortable. It was especially uncomfortable for me being a 22 year old kid, right? <laughs> who or, should not have had that job? No, who should <laughs> not all. have had that job? You're you're right. I mean, the, the psychologist, of course, they're trained and they they get to. Spend a little bit of time right. trying to build up trust. But that little bit of time, you're talking about 15, 20 minutes. And yes, they're professionals and they know how to ask questions and they what do. to do and everything. Yeah. But this is not an indictment of the psychologist. No, no, no. Right. <laughs> right. I'm sure that that person did a great job. Sure. You know, and maybe it was over several several sessions, even, right? Like maybe it wasn't just I one. I doubt it. If it was, if it was a CPS uh, interview, it was probably one session. Yeah. And it was show me on the doll where where they touched you kind yeah. of thing. Again, not to indict the the psychologists of the world or whatever, but yeah. Oftentimes, those types of allegations will not be founded based on just that interview. Right. And from a CPS perspective, unfortunately, that interview would be all that they would have to go on. Right, at yeah. At least for the sexual assault. Yeah. Now, there's a host of other issues, like I, like I said on the on the last episode, that CPS... The cocaine? ...should have definitely <laughs> been involved with. However, the 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 sexual abuse as a CPS worker, if you can't have or you don't get positive affirm, positive affirmation of of that occurring from that psych psychologist interview, then you can't remove the child. Yeah. Now again, ch- you know, check that box off, but <laughs> maybe investigate a little bit more. Right, about and some other it's also unclear to me <clears throat> if these interviews took place before or after this video. Yeah, right. You know? Right. Because if it was before, maybe she just wasn't ready. Right, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's the biggest thing, is that this... And hell, fuck it. Even if it was after this video, maybe she wasn't ready. Right, just you like know? you said, you know, she was sitting in her in her dad's car... Yeah. ...surrounded by family members when she was freaking out on the verge of getting put back into a a potentially dangerous situation. If we are to believe that that's what was happening. Yeah. That that's when she said it. And she said it, like you said, at towards the end of all of this interaction, when she's freaking out and she's doesn't want to go. And now we're at the point where she may have to go. And then she blurts it out like, "Ah, you know, Mr. Jake is touching me. Whereas, you know, if you're in a safe environment with the with a psychologist, right, where you don't feel like you're in you don't danger, feel threatened, right? Yeah, you, nobody else is in the room. It's you and and the child psychologist, and CPS is behind glass. You know, the two way mirror where yeah, the, the child doesn't know that you're actually listening. It's a different environment. You're in a relatively safe environment where you don't feel threatened, which is the whole point. Yes. Yes. However, you're also in a sterile environment with somebody that you don't know. Mm-hmm. So the two situations are, are are different. So there are a lot of people on the internet with, you know, with professional experience in cases like this who are you know, posting on forums like Web Sleuths has a lot of this, right? Where they're decoding, you know, all of the hearings and the motions. Like, you know, they're like, oh, yes, I'm a lawyer. I've been through family court. Like, this is what this motion means. This is what's happening now, blah, 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 blah. And that's all very good. But I, like, that's, I can't go through all of that. Like, that's not my deal, right? But you can find it on the internet. Like, go to the Web Sleuths forum that's great if you really want to dig into like all of the hearings that have been happening and like what it all means. But we're a podcast about missing persons and Sophie has been kidnapped. So we are going to skip ahead in this episode to July of this year of 2021. Again, since this video came out in August of 2020, 
things have obviously deteriorated to the point where the court didn't think Sophie should be with either of her parents for a while. Apparently, Michael had her at some point in late June, early July, but he was instructed to deliver her to her aunt in North Carolina and not speak to her for 90 days. So one of the big issues that we're dealing with in this case is Kelly accusing Michael of parental alienation. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later, but part of this whole thing that was going on legally at the time, at the beginning of the summer, was that the judge wanted to get Sophie basically out of both of the houses and start therapy for all three of the children and start a reunification process for Sophie and Kelly because the judge thought basically that Michael had been alienating Sophie from Kelly, and so they needed to be, she basically needed to be deprogrammed is what they're saying. So uh, while I I think that removing the children from both households at this point is definitely the best route. um, For sure, yes. I'm not entirely on board with the reintroduction into Kelly's life as though... I mean, you have allegations, you have right. allegations of, of sexual abuse in Kelly's house. Yeah. And nothing has changed. Like Jake, Mr. Jake is still, still in there. the house. Right. Right. Like, it's not like she left him. It's not like he's gone. It's not like she would just be coming home to her mother. Right. She would be going home to her mother and Mr. Jake. And as far as the parental alienation goes... Looking at it from the perspective of a parent who, who whose daughter says she's being sexually assaulted at mom's house, mm-hmm. like yes, um, yes, alienate, like <laughs> like alienate right. her from yeah. that situation. And the reason why it's not happening with the boys is because, well, pedophiles have a particular like. Well, and so that's one of the things that Kelly uses. She's like, well, if he actually thought the lawyers, they're like, well, if they actually, if he actually thought that Kelly was a pedophile, then why would he leave the two boys in her care and only be concerned about Sophie? I mean, there may have been some concern about the boys also, but pedophiles have a tendency to stick to a particular type of person that they that they violate. Right. It's, and it's usually age, sex, availability mm-hmm. sometimes. I mean, you know, it, it's it's very rare for a pedophile to span the spectrum of both girls and boys and various ages. They they usually stick to one in particular age group and one gender. Right. And Michael has never made any allegations that Mr. Jake has done anything sexually inappropriate with the two boys. So he's not saying that. He has never said that. He has always maintained that this is something that is happening to Sophie. Now, he has, again, like we kind of talked about in the last episode, called CPS on Kelly multiple times because there are other things. With the boys. Right, with all of them. With all right? of them, yes. Where right. he feels like they're not in a safe environment. Right. But in terms of the sexual abuse, he has only ever said that Mr. That Jake was that doing that to Sophie, Sophie yes. not to the boys. Right. This aunt in North Carolina is apparently somebody with whom Sophie was close. Like she, so is this, is this Michael's? No, sister. it's Kelly's. Kelly's sister. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, exactly. So on paper, though, it seems like a good move because I completely agree. Like, I don't think she should have been in either of their houses at yeah. this point. Yeah. And, you know, taking her to a trusted relative is much better than, you know, putting her in foster care, for oh, instance. Oh, yeah. No, right? absolutely. Absolutely. And North Carolina, because again, 
both Kelly and Michael live in Texas. So that also puts physical distance mm-hmm. between them, which is, I think, good in this case. Yes. So that was the plan, right? So the plan was Michael, I guess, had Sophie and he was supposed to take her to North Carolina, take her to the aunt's house and not speak to her for 90 days with the idea that she was basically going to be deprogrammed because legally everybody is on Kelly's side at this point. Sophie was last seen in Guadalupe County, which is where Michael lives on July 12th of 2021. A few days later, he, you know, had just a regular scheduled court hearing because they have a lot of regularly <laughs> scheduled court hearings. Sure. So he showed up to that, but he showed up without Sophie. And he said that he would only bring Sophie back if he was given a jury trial. Like, basically, he does not trust the system at this point. He doesn't trust the judge. He doesn't trust the lawyers. He doesn't trust anybody. He wants a jury to kind of, like, hear this case. Great, but I don't think he's entitled to that. He's not. So that's an issue. Kelly's attorneys, unsurprisingly, did not want this. So she filed a motion opposing the jury trial and demanding that Long be summarily jailed for 18 months for hiding Sophie and failing to hand her over. She is also asking for Long to be placed on probation for 10 years, be held on a $20,000 bond, and to cover her legal costs. Wow. Yeah. So they're really, uh, they're both just going for it. They are. They are. And so this is where we are at this point. At the beginning of the summer, Michael believes he's saving his oldest daughter from persistent sexual abuse at the hands of her mother's boyfriend. Kelly believes that Michael is unstable and that this is a case of parental alienation. The guardian ad litem who was assigned to this case in 2020 agrees. And now a guardian ad litem, for those of you who don't know, is a lawyer who is appointed by the court to be like a neutral third party in Mm -hmm. situations like this. She says that Michael has subjected the children, particularly Sophie, to parental alienation, which is, quote, a type of child abuse in which he has consistently used psychological manipulation to turn the children against the other parent, end quote. So their contention is that basically Michael brainwashed Sophie into believing that this abuse happened, that everything in the home is fine. And the viral video that was released last year isn't evidence of physical abuse on Kelly's part, but evidence of psychological abuse on Michael's part. Uh, that's, a, that's a really fine line to dance there. Regardless of whether they're right or wrong, who, whoever is telling the truth here, these kids are caught in the middle. Yeah. And they're the victims of everything all of this, of both parents, of the legal system, of everything. And I'm sorry, but both parents are using the kids. And that's, that's really sad in this situation, is that the parents are using the kids as pawns to get back at the, at the other one, regardless of, of any of these allegations. Right. And that's bad enough. And that's a fairly common thing in contentious divorces and contentious child custody cases. But to add the possible sexual abuse on top of that. Right. Jesus Christ. And I just, I don't, you don't have that visceral emotional reaction like she has just from being coached. Like, yeah, I, I, And I was reading something on parental alienation and it was saying that people who are a victim of this kind of behave like cult members and, you know, they just are completely broken from reality and truly believe what has been fed to them, which kind of leads to these emotional responses. But 
I just, I don't know. I just have a really, really hard time because everything about the emotion that she was displaying just seems so raw and so real. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough to, to know who to believe in this situation, but the kids are the ones that are paying for it. Yeah. For all of it, regardless of who's right, who's wrong, what's actually happening, what's not happening. And that's just, that's terrible. So the guardian ad litem seems to be firmly in Kelly's camp. She says, and there are text messages to back this up. So this is definitely real that Michael told Sophie not to trust her and hindered her investigative process. But more importantly, the guardian ad litem has said that she does not believe that the sexual abuse that Sophie says occurred actually happened. According to her report, quote, the guardian ad litem takes SL's allegation of sexual abuse extremely seriously. However, after extensive consideration and consultation with experts, the guardian ad litem does not believe that it occurred. Okay, so these are the same experts that we already talked about. I assume. Where... Yeah, like the forensic psychologist and Sophie didn't say that she had been abused. Assaulted, right. But what they're also saying is that she has been examined by medical doctors who have not found evidence of abuse. I guess, what, is, what does that mean, though? Because there is absolutely sexual abuse that would be easily found by medical doctors. Sure. But... There's a lot of abuse that wouldn't. Right. Yeah, and we don't need to get into the, the details of any of that, but, you know, I mean, there are inappropriate touches that... Won't show up in a medical exam. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, again, we've already talked about the comfort level and willingness of a, of a victim to admit to something like that, especially, especially a child. Right. You know, it's... it's there's a certain amount of, of grooming that occurs before anything physical actually happens mm -hmm. where you're, you're basically coached and taught to think that this is okay. This is what people who quote unquote love each other do mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And as a child hearing this from somebody that is supposed to love you and take care of you, you, f you, you buy into it. And so things happen, you feel uncomfortable. And then now we're talking about admitting to that. Yeah. There's, a, there's the, the double psychological twist there of admitting to it also means that, that you're betraying the person that quote unquote loves you. Mm -hmm. That's typical feeling of anybody that's, that's been abused is you start making excuses for the abuser. Right. So... You know, one interview with a child psychologist that probably took 30 minutes, that's not the end-all be-all. So there's more to this Guardian ad litem report that we'll get to in a minute. But, you know, we do have a court-appointed lawyer, a neutral third party, saying that this abuse did not happen. Furthermore, after Michael took off with Sophie, his own wife, Courtney Chalmers, posted on Facebook that she didn't think Sophie was safe with him. Her post says in part, quote, a psychological evaluation reported Michael is not a stable person for Sophie to be with, and he has threatened to flee the country with her. If you see Michael and Sophie, please do not approach them or post it on social media. Call the Guadalupe County Sheriff's Office, end quote. What psychological report is she referring to? I don't know. I am assuming that that was just like one part of the many court hearings that have been happening in the past year. Yeah. And hey, look, she might be right. Yeah. I mean, clear, well, I mean, honestly, I, I yeah. buy it. <laughs> I, that doesn't negate her allegations against the mom. No. And the mom's boyfriend. No. 
you know, they're trying to make these as one and the same, like Michael's crazy. And so what Sophie's saying isn't true to me. I feel like both things can be true. Yes. Michael could be fucking crazy. And Sophie could have also been abused. Yes, absolutely. I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I agree with you hundred percent. Neither of these living situations are, are okay. No. So Courtney posted this back in July not long after Michael took Sophie and left. Like I want to say it was maybe 10 days later. So we have Michael ordered to turn Sophie over to her aunt and not speak to her for 90 days. We have a guardian ad litem who says that the sexual abuse never happened. And we have Michael's own wife who says that he's not a stable person for Sophie to be with. So is Kelly right? Is this just the vendetta of a mentally unstable man? Is Sophie just a pawn in this whole battle? Regardless of whether the allegations of sexual abuse are true or not, that like 100% the kids are pawns in this battle. Because even saying that makes it, leaves the possibility open for Sophie not telling the truth. And I don't, I, I, I don't think that that's an option. Like, I don't think that necessarily, I a hundred percent believe that she was being abused in some way. Well, it seems like it. I think that what we saw in that video, like something was happening, something very bad was happening. And in addition to that, the kids are all being damaged by this entire process. Yeah, and that's what I meant. I didn't I didn't mean that them being pawns in this negated what she was saying. Yeah. In this report, the Guardian ad litem enumerated the reasons she doesn't believe Sophie's claims. Quote First, many, if not all, of SL's allegations are simply not believable. For example, her allegation that she was raped by multiple men in a hotel room is disproven by the security video that shows no such other men entering the room in the time that SL was there. Likewise, the allegations that she was sexually abused over a hundred times and that her mother watched her being sexually abused on multiple occasions is not credible. In this regard, it is noteworthy that SL's allegations became more and more outrageous as time went on, and as must have appeared to her or and more, I think she means more and more, but whatever, or and more, that she needed to make more serious allegations to stay with her father, end quote. Now, this is presented as evidence, and like people in Kelly's camp, like on Twitter, like present this as like, Michael is crazy. Sophie is fine. He needs to bring her home. Like this is evidence in Kelly's favor. But to me, this sounds like a little girl who is not being believed by the adults in her life and is getting increasingly desperate. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree. I, I, it's, we have the security footage at the hotel, right? Like, okay. There is at least some evidence of that. I, I'm not sure what this security footage is or if it actually shows the actual room where they were staying in or whatever. Right. I don't know a lot of details, but after this whole um, GoFundMe thing happened and the video happened and there was like a Facebook group, basically I kind of mentioned before that like Kelly and Mr. Jake started being docs and they got death threats. So at one point they actually left their home and stayed in a hotel mm -hmm. because they were like afraid for their safety. So I'm assuming that these allegations are st stemming from that. I'll give you that. But then she's just like these allegation, these other allegations of, mom being present and yeah. Jake sexually assaulting her, she deemed them not credible based on what? Based on everything that we said. So like one, that she didn't tell the forensic psychologist that she was being abused. What they're saying is that their medical doctors didn't find physical signs of abuse and that her stories 
became more and more unbelievable, meaning like she told the story about being raped by four men in this hotel. Surveillance footage saw no men coming in or out of this hotel room. But who's to say that we have kids? Yeah. That are older than her, but, you know, we had them at that age. I mean, they can't tell time now. No. Or recall dates now. So who's to say that 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 specific time was when she was alleging it happened? Yeah, and that's a good point. Like, but to me, again, I just see a little girl who's just getting increasingly desperate because, like, people aren't taking her out of the situation, right? Right. Right. Nobody is helping her. She is still with these parents. And so, yes, maybe she is now, a year later, starting to just say more and more outlandish things going like, okay, I told them what was happening. That wasn't enough, apparently. Right. Nobody's what about if, like, four fucking men came in? Like, what about if this happened? What about if that happened? Like, to me, even if those particular words are not true, the feeling, the emotion, the fear, the terror, everything behind them is coming from a very true place. Yeah, and it's coming from a place of her not being listened to and her not being protected. Right. right. And that's exactly what I said is the feeling when you say things, when you, when you come out with, with things like that, you, you, as a child, you express that emotion and no one listens to you and nobody, yeah. nobody takes care of you. I don't know how else to say it other than you become fractured. You, you just, you aren't the same. I mean, it fits. Nobody was there to protect her then. So. And it just, it, I mean, it makes me feel crazy just reading about it. So I can only imagine how this poor little girl feels, right? Because like, I just see this and I go like, she's clearly just saying shit so somebody will listen. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that maybe this child sexual abuse didn't happen. Something is going on there, though. And it's not just it's not just the dad brainwashing her or whatever. Like something is happening here. She doesn't feel safe in mom's house. Yeah. Clearly being with dad is not safe. Why is she with either of them? Right. And so it, like I said, so it does seem in July that the court was kind of like catching up to this a little bit, but it was hard because this guardian ad litem is so far in Kelly's camp that everything was really going Kelly's way, you know, like, yes, Sophie was going to be put with the aunt, but as far as I know, the two boys were still with Kelly. And the whole thing was there was going to be this reunification process started. So right. the the objective, the goal was to get Sophie back in Kelly's house. That was the goal. Michael couldn't do it. You know, when I when I first started working on this story, you came in and you asked me if I was researching something that was making me cry. <laughs> and the answer was yes because I was watching the video for the first time and I was watching a little girl scream over and over that this is real life why don't you believe me she asked this multiple times she said she was smart multiple times she was met with I guarantee that didn't happen and dismissive comments about her getting the lead in the school play so she must be okay Sophie's grandmother and mother did not believe her for a second. Was every claim that Sophie has made over the past year 100% true? Probably not. But do I believe she's a victim of abuse? Absolutely. There's a high volume of police calls at Kelly's house. Even if you take out the ones made by Michael, there has been at least one DV call there. Sophie's seven-year-old brother tested positive for cocaine. If the test was a hair follicle test, it would have had to have happened at Kelly's house. Things are clearly not okay over there. But in September of 2020, so like a whole year ago, the Guardian ad litem recommended that the children be placed with Kelly instead of Michael. 
but I'm going to say it. I don't like this person. I don't like this guardian ad litem. And I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I can understand why Michael told Sophie not to trust her. I want to share one more line from the Guardian Ad Litem's findings. Quote, Further, Guardian Ad Litem's observations and the observations of professionals who have seen her confirm that SL has the capacity and ability to be highly manipulative. End quote. This is a, a, a 10-year-old girl? Yeah. So the unbiased guardian ad litem yeah. is victim blaming here. Yep. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing. I live, I was like, all right, fuck it. Like I'm flipping tables. Like I, to me, this guardian ad litem has zero credibility at this point. <laughs> it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like they care about the child at all. They they're supposed to be the child advocate. Yeah. Not not just siding with one parent or the other or saying that this child is fucked up in the head. Like that's not the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to take all of the evidence into consideration and listen to the child and determine what's best for the child. And this doesn't sound like they're listening to anything at all no. other th other than Kelly. No. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a child psychologist, but like, I don't trust somebody who would say that about a child who at the very, 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 very least is in an extremely stressful and unstable environment. Like with all of the shit going on, you're going to come out and say that she's manipulative. Right. What the fuck? Yeah. Blame, blaming the victim and, the 10 year old victim. And don't get it twisted. She is a victim. Sophie is a victim here. Even, yes. even if all of the allegations are false, it doesn't change the fact that she and her brothers are victims here of a terrible, terrible situation and a really fucked up divorce proceeding. They, as children, children are not mentally okay no so you for, for her to 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 go off and say that this 10 year old girl is highly manipulative i mean that that shows her her bias right yeah. there she's she's not she's not advocating for the child at all she, no, she's no. she's looking to close this case and move on yeah this that line negated every single other thing yeah i, I in agree. the report to me i agree that she's just she's showing bias at the beginning of August, you know, a few weeks, two, three weeks after Michael took Sophie and went underground, he actually came out of hiding to meet with a Daily Mail reporter at an undisclosed location. So he had Sophie with him. And the reporter says that Sophie appeared to be relaxed and happy with her father. Michael told the reporter, quote, I'd absolutely go to jail to protect Sophie. I'd do anything for her. She's a 10-year-old child. She shouldn't have to be dealing with this stuff. These high-conflict custody cases, this wasn't about getting into a custody case. This was about getting justice for my daughter. It turned into that because the system didn't take action as they promised they would. People like to say this is a vendetta against my ex. No, it's not. This is about a little girl who made an outcry and has the diagnosis and has not gotten justice. There's no way I'm going to turn my back on her now, end quote. So like you were saying, when you were like, oh, if my kid was in this situation, I'd just go to jail. That's exactly what Michael did. He said he wasn't going to do this. And so he took Sophie and he ran. Yeah. And look, I'm not advocating for that. No. But I can certainly see how he could become frustrated and do it. And I can also see the flip side to that is that Kelly's lawyers can now use that as further evidence. Of him that, being completely unstable. Right. Yeah. But put myself in his situation. What are you going to do? Do you just give in? 
and give your daughter up to somebody that that you know is is sexually assaulting them just because that's what the court orders? Or do you say, fuck it, I'm going to take my kid and remove them from the situation? An arrest warrant was issued for Michael the day after this interview when there was another hearing that he failed to appear for. So he's been charged with parental kidnapping, among other things. In early September, when he still failed to produce Sophie, his parental rights were also terminated, mm-hmm. which, you that, know, you can't kidnap a kid and sure. keep your parental rights. Like, sure. That's, that's you know. <laughs> this, is, this is all le- legal <laughs> Everything system. else the side. Yes. <laughs> that, that's all legal system stuff. Yeah. 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 I get it, but I'm not sure I wouldn't. Do the same thing, given the same set of circumstances. I don't know. Yeah, Michael described his move to the reporter during this interview as a way to buy time because he was afraid of what would happen to Sophie if he turned her over to Kelly's family. Like I mentioned before, that aunt in North Carolina is Kelly's sister. But, you know, you can't just kidnap your kid. Right. No, absolutely. (laughs) Michael told the reporter that they had friends who were helping them out and that Sophie had been spending a lot of time swimming and doing like other kid things over the summer. Sophie spoke to the reporter like and told, you know, the reporter like about all the stuff she had been doing. And, you know, like I said, the reporter thought she seemed very relaxed and happy. But now it's the end of September as of this recording. Summer is over. Sophie turned 11 a few weeks ago. School has started, and Michael and Sophie are still gone. The Stand with Sophie hashtag from last year has been replaced by the Bring Sophie Home hashtag. Sophie's home life with her mother, Mr. Jake, was clearly not healthy. But neither is being on the run with her father, who does seem to have issues of his own. I don't know how this story is going to end, but I just hope that the system will work in a way that gets Sophie to a safe place with the help that she needs. Sophie Elise Long has been missing since July 12th, 2021. She's believed to be with her father, Michael Long. Sophie's 11 years old. She is five feet tall and approximately 95 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. She has a small scar from a burn on one of her arms. Michael Long is 43 years old. He is six foot four and approximately 205 pounds. Michael Long is possibly driving an off-white 2010 Ford Edge SUV or a gray van with blacked out windows, an NRA sticker, and a black rack on the top. Anyone with information on the case is urged to contact the Texas Department of Public Safety's Missing Persons Clearinghouse at 512-424-5074. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. We'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!